Duda ante dame uche. Taltanja aste tetskia the dat says he. Etu itenit clagotin putin ja astin. Medu dene maskum squamish swillituth dene soganasin. Edidi ja jani da ne ke estin medu sa astin. So medu, uh, thank you to to Maya and Kate for the introduction and also just for inviting me to come and speak to everybody today. And it's just really nice to see some familiar folks in, in the participants. Uh, just saying a little hello and uh, I'm just really happy to be here uh, to share this work with you all. Uh, my name is Thema, which means Mother of Rocks in, in Taltan language. And um, yeah, maybe we'll go straight into a short, uh, short video that, that was created, uh, co-created with uh, C Magazine and, uh, and my partner, Jonathan Agoras. And so we've been working on a draft that's gonna be released in the next few days, uh, a, fi a final, video to uh, to talk a little bit about the work. So I'll just get into that right now. We are connected to mind sites, to methods of production and repercussions of our thirst for natural resources. Dudante, Thanasotia, Thema Ushie. My name is Thema. I am an interdisciplinary artist working mainly in sculpture and installation but really drawing on whatever medium speaks to my concept. I make artwork that connects materials to mine sites and bodies to the land. These small sculptures, uh, what is left, are in configurations like natural copper nuggets. Making them was a real turning point in my art career because it helped me speak to the complicated relationship that I have with corporate industry. I also was thinking about what would happen if I deprocessed an object so that the viewer or so that I can see these natural elements used in manufacturing and in this way could relate to them in, through the system that produced it. So through mining and exploration, colonial governments, indigenous relations, processes of consumption and environmental impacts. So how I came to speak about mining in my artwork is through my summer job during my undergrad at Emily Carr University, where I worked as a scientist field assistant at some of the many mines that are operating in Teltan territory. Uh, much of Teltan territory is located in what is known as the Golden Triangle in the mining industry. And it's called this because of the plentiful gold and copper deposits many of the mines that I worked in were mining for copper. I have a push-pull relationship with industry, having worked for and against the mines. I have worked to conduct environmental baseline studies that have helped mines get their operating permits, and at other times, protested mines operating in sacred headwaters. And most important, being educated on the land through my Teltan grandparents, showing me what is at stake when mining replaces our ancestral sustenance. Although I consider corporate mining as we know it today as part of a colonial capitalist enterprise, my ancestors have mined obsidian and copper since time immemorial. What I am thinking about in my art is that contemporary ore derived from indigenous territory is transported elsewhere to be refined, transformed, used, and touched. And I imagine refining an everyday object to its core material. For instance, the penny, the former one cent coin, which has many layers of meaning being made of copper, including being very important to indigenous people. This object questions value in multiple contexts being related to both cultural and industrial practices. What is left is a springboard for several veins of my practice, uh, Future Generations, which is an exploration in indigenous futurity, the Ore Body series, my landmine thesis exhibition, and the work that I'm pursuing right now, which is a contemporary art reflection of Teltan Potlatch Ceremony. For C Magazine, I've created a limited edition of 50 unique sculptures made from now defunct Canadian pennies that are 1996 and older. 
And this is because after 1996, the penny was still made of mostly copper. And then after this date was nickel plated because of the increased market value of copper. I melt the pennies with an oxy acetylene torch. I have them sandblasted and then hand sand and burnish them to shine and clean the sculptures. Each work is then kept in a black acrylic box that is also a plinth for the work. Thank you all for, for listening. And um, yeah, I hope that you can uh, see a little bit of the process of the sculpture and, and the significance, especially to do with, with my very long-term engagement with mining politics. And uh, like, like I was saying in the video, and like I say in many of my presentations that this work is a real, turning point and, and a linchpin in my practice because when I was trying to describe how to how to connect viewers especially doing my master's degree in OCAD trying to connect the viewer back to the territories that would have produced the copper was really challenging especially in a gallery setting so my my ambition was to was to show that through touch of an everyday object, through, through money or through our telephones or through the, the use and consumption of electricity, which needs the, you know, which needs the, the copper wire. Um, and of course, produce this, this demand for copper in our, in our modern age. Um, and, and also increase the value of copper and then increase then the, the mining and exploration um, in, in indigenous territories. And I just wanna, you know, like I wanna acknowledge as well that um, my territory is located within the Golden Triangle. So I, I spoke about that a little bit in the video as well. Uh, so this is because of the, the, um, the mainly gold and copper um, deposits that are um, that are located within this, this triangle in BC um, that's drawn on the, the map there. And, and much of that triangle is located in, in Taltan territory. And in my practice and in my writing, I started to make this correlation between these, these um, ne neocolonial mining efforts uh, of corporate mining um, and then uh, seeing so many of my relatives and then also I started to work in the mines as well for what I was thinking was helping this, uh, helping the environment and soon to realize that the, the industries needed this work in order to open, open these, uh, these mines to get their environmental permits and to create these baseline studies to see what's there before and then um, monitor the process throughout. And so in the same way that I thought that I was helping, I was also helping, helping the, the industries to be able to, to go to the next phase of mining. And now this, this is this real um, conundrum in, in my practice and this kind of sweet spot where I really like to work is, is um, seeing and acknowledging that my ancestors also mined, but they mined or harvested in a different kind of a way. Um, and then seeing my relatives and, and so many Teltans work in the mines uh, today, seeing also how it puts food immediately on their table, even if it means that they are actively mining somewhere where they had spent their childhood hunting for moose or knowing that this tailings pond, it could contaminate one of our salmon bearing rivers. Uh, so, so this is this, um, 
this dependence um, in a way in this industry, but also this, um, yes, I, I like to say it's a push, push, pull relationship, but not only for me, but also uh, for many who are consuming this material. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to move on to a little bit of a discussion that, that Maya and I have planned for each other. Um, and then at the same time, I have a few slides um, that I can, I can have up um, and then Maya and I can, can talk a little bit about uh, the work, about what I've been working on since the pandemic and, uh, and we can share a little bit to do with that. Just while I'm waiting for Maya here, I'll, um, I'll show you some of the work, which is also in my background. And this is why I queued it up in my background actually is, is for this project here, which was a teleportation suit that I made early pandemic when I was on Zoom all the time. I still am on Zoom all the time. Um, when I when I made a, a work suit out of a green screen and a, and a green screen, and then I had my friend, uh, Kaylee Spitzer, who's a, a well-known photographer, Zoom, zoom me in um, and, and she took some screenshots of, the, of, of me performing with this, uh, with this suit. I love that. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I just didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> That's a cool, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, and here's another one. This is one of the, one of the mountains in, in uh, the Spectrum Range, which is another, I mean, there was like, there's two works that really um, helped me communicate the kinds of things that I was thinking about when I was starting to work with these concepts of mining. And, um, you know, it was the, the penny work, what is left to really be able to show that this everyday object, it's, it's got so many layers of meaning and value. Um, and then also another series that I was working with um, that, was, that was connecting some of these minerals in the land to the minerals in our body. So trying to trying to connect um, these places to also our bodies and the way that we consume and, and the kind of impacts that it has um, on, on us, whether we see it, um, see the, you know, see, see the consumption of the material or whether, or whether we're slightly removed from these spaces. Yeah, so this is, uh, I don't even want to admit how long ago actually that I did work in the mines <laughs> when I was going to school at Emily Cart. Um, my, my brother, I like to give him a bit of a shout out. He's, he's become a, a mining engineer and so that he can ha and really have a voice at the table. But one thing that we both really draw on um, both both my brothers and I is is this education that we also received on the land at the same time as we were working for uh, our degrees and so we really knew in another way what was at stake and and not just specifically me and my brothers but also the many people who were working in this industry and then also you know had, had spent some time hunting and fishing and and harvesting from the land. Uh, this, is, this is one of the pictures of, uh, of a kokanee that, that, um, that me and uh, Laura, the scientist that I was working on, we, we, uh, we found in Mess Lake. And it was trapped there after a volcanic earthquake, we assume. Because there's no way of getting the salmon there otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is a bitumen stomach sculpture as part of uh, one of my one of my latest exhibitions at Grant, which is um, an exhibition that we moved from Calgary in 2018 to or was it 2019? I believe it was 2018, and then we moved it uh, to Vancouver. So come up with a new iteration. Um, the flag that I was performing with in in the forest here in Vancouver is a is a one of the pieces that i made for this show which is meant to disintegrate it's made out of silk so over the course of um 
it's existing in the world is, is um, meant to kind of fall apart as this, as this uh, symbol also of the, the failing oil industry. And then also the kinds of, I guess this, again, complicated uh, relationship that, that many have with the oil industry, but uh, also this, this reliance on this material um, that helps us, uh, I'll say in quotation marks, survive, because I absolutely believe we can survive in a world without oil. Um, but, but this is the kind of, this is the kind of response that I was getting from uh, working with, with a lot of youth, actually, when I asked the question of, of what, what is this material? And then, and then also uh, what, what comes from this material. And so we would get a lot of uh, dialogue coming uh, out, of, out of that prompt, including um, electricity, gasoline, diesel, um, some, somebody said pollution, sure, that also comes from this material. Um, but I really wanted to get into kind of some of the every, the everyday, um, associations that are so disassociated from this original, like black sticky substance, like, um, like the kinds of plastics that we use every day or, or like acrylic, um, as an artist, you know, use acrylic medium, um, not to, you know, not to be naive to say that, all, you know, all of these kinds of things come from the Canadian oil sands, but just the potential of this material and then surrounding us in our everyday uh, situations. And I try to <laughs> try to add on, especially um, for our environmentalist friends, uh, Gore-Tex, you know, just to talk about the kinds of things that we wear uh, that are also made from uh, the oil oil byproduct and and how when protesting a pipeline in Vancouver you're going to be able to see this this contradiction um, this kind of uh, kind of a, 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 a un, like an under undermining of a lot of environmental issues which is somewhat it's somewhat weak. Um, of a, you know, of an argument, but, but what you hear a lot of on the industry side, and actually what I get a lot of support from industry folks in speaking about my work is um, they go, exactly, you, you could have a problem with this industry, and then you support this industry at the same time. Um, and so, Again, I want to make my position very clear that I do not agree with the practices of corporate mining, but I absolutely acknowledge our part in this, uh, in the industry, including oil. Um, do I want a pipeline to Vancouver? No. Do I... <laughs> Do I know, you know, do I know how to propose us, propose us out of the energy crisis? Um, no, but I can absolutely talk about, um, talk about those in between issues. Um, again, coming with a very similar mindset as the, the copy, copper penny work, uh, what is left. Um, I can, you know, I can transfer that concept to the bitumen as well to say uh, we are connected to the oil sands. We're connected to the issues that surround the oil sands through the use and consumption of, of, uh, of oil byproducts on a, on a daily basis and also how we consume them uh, with one time use and uh, without regard for the territories that they're coming from. Emma, I'm wondering, um, cause I really love this like bitumen stomach and you also spoke about your work with plastic um, and, and bitumen and now copper. 
And one of the conversations that we touched on a year ago when you and I were working on a project together, I was all about extractivism. Um, what was really interesting to me was conversations about the history of mining, indigenous mining, and how these objects have been used in the past. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about like Teltan mining practices in the past and also, I know you're not from this region, but uh, I know that you've you've been to the tar sands and you've spoken um, to communities who live in this area. You've been on tours. Um, so to talk a little bit also about the history of bitumen and how bitumen has been used in these communities. If you know, I can a little bit talk about that as well. But to me, it's really interesting how, you know, a lot of people think of these materials as extractivist materials um and what i've learned from from you really um is how we can understand these materials with a different kind of mindset or to understand their history more deeply um beyond the confines of of how we see them today which it's really just like within this kind of strict sense of extractivist materials where copper either goes into our, our electrical wiring and bitumen powers or cars for example yeah, for sure, for sure. Let, well, let me show you another uh, another work here. Is um, this work was was photographed in two thousand nineteen? It's a performance that I call um, "Real Camo." the The suit that I'm working on is another one. I mean, that I'm that I'm performing in is made from a material that I had printed in a. Uh, a repeating pattern from a photograph that I took when I first visited and to uh, visited this this area here in in 2015 14 14 and was the first time that I had gone to the obsidian quarry so this is our this is our our ancestral place that we harvested obsidian um, it would have been the, the most valuable material at the time um, because it's also the, the sharpest natural material breaking at a true point and, uh, rather than even metal, which has a micro bevel. And you know, this, is, this is, for me, this is the most beautiful designs. Um, I ended up showing this work alongside some, some arrowheads and, and some of the the artifacts that were collected from this area, as well as after the 2018 uh, fire. So this is this is um, work that um, our, our archaeologists that that came with us had um, had collected just before taking a trip with Taltan youth on a land-based education trip to the the quarry. And so we, we provided them with several different lenses to look at this place. You know, I spoke about it in the way that I sp speak about our ancestral mining and, um, and Brendan, our archeologist spoke about it in, in these, these um, historical kinds of ways. And, um, or I guess anthropological kind of ways, because not, because this, uh, this writing is really in this writing is in the stone, if you want to say. I, I really talk about obsidian carrying the 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 memory of my ancestors because we would carry this stone from. Wait a second. We carry this stone from Zaida to all parts of our territories and beyond, and. Today we know that we can trace these this rock back to the volcano that birthed it through uh, through shining lights through them and finding these spectrums of, of minerals that traces it right back to the source. But I also see this this uh, this this other way of seeing it as well, where we're following the trails that lead to and from this place. Um, and, and along, you know, every rest stop and campsite, 
you see these places where the where the ore is being transformed into <clears throat> into arrowheads, into blades, into spearheads. And in this way, this rock needed to be transported by my ancestors in order to get to the places that it ended up. And so it carries this memory with it. And it also proves to proves our use and occupancy of the ter of the territory and our strong trading relationships outside of the territory for the obsidian that comes back here. And, uh, you know, you, you, you asked me like how we mined. Uh, and I mean, I use mining kind of fast and loose um, in my practice, because sometimes I do talk about mining as a kind of other kinds of extraction, like research or, um, or even doing interviews. And so you just like, for me, thinking about extractus practices, I think also in, in the kind of balance that, that, that my ancestors are giving me an example for. For instance, when out, when out harvesting, we're taught to leave a gift for the mountain or to leave a gift. And, you know, for me, I, I at first accepted this, this practice as a, as a spiritual gesture. Um, now I see it through the work that I am doing in, in Potlatch's methodology, also as a microcosm to show this, or to, to show this, um, this way that we're not only people who take from the land, but also people who give back. And so by giving even a small gift, um, very intentionally back when you take, it's a way to re restore a balance in the way that we were living. And uh, so I just wonder like what kind of conscious effort uh, when we consume, you know, could we be more mindful? Could we be, uh, could we shift our mindset to know that whatever we take in, um, there's also this this way, like this way of giving giving back, and so being probably more conscious of giving back than taking in, because I believe that we're pretty natural consumers. And so this this is one one way that I talk about Taltan ancestral mining, um, and to kind of challenge the system that exists currently. Uh, I can, you know, go into a little bit of copper as well. You know, copper is a, is a natural, is a natural, um, comes in natural nuggets and then would be formed by not only people in Taltan territory, but outside of that as well. And could be cold forged, could be melted together, could be made into all kinds of amazing objects. And this is, this is also, uh, you know, worldwide. Uh, in, in indigenous value for this material because it is soft, malleable, and and then comes in natural natural kinds of nuggets. Um, but I might get, you know, like like I did do my research in the oil sands. But I know Maya that you also worked with an artist who was who was working with bitumen in a little bit more of an intimate way than I was. And I'd, I'd love it actually, if you can talk a little bit about their work um, and, and the kind of discoveries that they made through, through um, a more intimate ways of using bitumen uh, in the past. Yeah, of course. I mean, you and I um, had worked on an exhibition that I curated last year at the Art Gallery of Guelph that um, had a lot of, of these themes in the curatorial premise. We worked with artist uh, Warren K. Rue, and he is based in the prairies, um, and he's been doing a lot of work with uh, taking photographs um, and then through a kind of tin type process that he's devised himself, um, making these photographs out of bitumen on metal. And he takes uh, photographs of, of the tar sands. And he spoke to both you and I about his process um, uh, of collecting natural discharge of, uh, of bitumen in the, in the tar sands and also 
um, you know, when he did that, there was this kind of reciprocity that I also find in, in your work, Emma, of, you know, giving something back. I think he also would offer tobacco. And um, so this idea that there's a relationship, that there's a relationship between the artist and the material that goes just beyond a kind of material sense in, in, its, in its basic form. And I was really interested in the story that he told us where he said that he's also researched the history of bitumen in this area and how it's been used by the, ind the indigenous communities in the area. And he mentioned that it was used to seal up canoes. And I really, really loved that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I had also heard that when I was, when I was traveling more um, I mean, and, then, yeah. and then found out a little bit more about it in the, in, in the museum there in, in uh, Calgary. We went through some of the archives is, yeah, some interesting photos and interesting history. So yeah, that black gold. Very, yeah. uh, very <laughs> enticing with the properties of oil and just so desperate to extract it from the sand. <laughs> right, yeah. Also yeah, not yeah. black gold. Yeah, I believe um, you called the tar sands Mordor. <laughs> well, especially because we come, we came straight from. Um, so the trip, trip the year before that I took, or that the, that we we did the real camel performance, the trip the year before with the youth, we came off the mountain early because of forest fires, and I went from my territory. <laughs> with a few of the youth that that stayed behind to make sandwiches for the firefighters it was quite a crisis <laughs> um, so I went straight from there to uh, Calgary and and then took this road trip to the oil sands and we just kept on getting more north and coming to, coming to Edmonton not being able to see the car in front of us uh, the smoke and then into the oil sands of which had their fires a few years right. before that so there's this this somewhat somewhat um i mean recovering landscape i don't want to you know paint to paint a false picture but still still evidence of those fires and then the doing a loop around the tailings ponds of several several of the larger uh projects and having the smoke also present from my territory. And, and you know, we, I use this actually as an analogy too, to talk about these, these weather divides that don't have borders or these weather systems that don't have borders. I didn't mean to say divides there. Um, and then how we're, you know, like it was another an analogy for being connected to these sites of industry. And also like I just did, it didn't click that the oil sands are adjacent to the mining that's happening in Taltan territory. <laughs> like I, I really, like I'd even separated myself from there being like, it's so flat, it's so far away. Uh, but if there was a, you know, like if there, but there is the Alaska highway that connects kind of the Northern, Northern parts of, um, of, the, you know, tre Treaty 8 there and Taltan territory area. And um, we're, we're just closer than we think. We're, we're closer to these impacts. You know, these provincial borders didn't matter. I mean, this, this work though, especially bringing it to Vancouver, you know, I had, I, I and also in work that I also have to talk about here, talking about uranium is the themes that continue to come up and the material that I will be working with um, probably for the next 10 years is water um, being the, you know, as resource. Uh, so I know this is also complicated. I mean, we see this with um, issues fighting, fighting Coca-Cola or Nestle from, you know, from monetizing the, the, the water, um, but it's also in, in, economic predictions that this is our next big resource. This is the next, this is the next resource that Canada will have for 
uh, for sale. And, you know, and, and a lot of what we've done already is going to threaten this resource, this, um, yeah, it, it, it has threatened this resource. <laughs> so yeah. this, is, this is one of the new works, one of the newer works for Grant. And I couldn't not talk about Bitchman and bring this work from Alberta without speaking to protest and these kind of issues and protests. Um, and the monument, I mean, I was, I was living between the States and, and Canada uh, during the pandemic because my, my partner is American and we, we came from San Francisco before the pandemic. I, I was on the way back from a uh, art trip in, in Australia and I decided to, to rebook my ticket to stay with my parents to wait out the pandemic, which ended up being like, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and living with my parents for four months and, and wondering when I'll be able to see my partner again. <laughs> it was a real uh, introspective kind of a time. And, but then when, when the borders opened again and I was able to go back to, especially North Carolina, this work actually comes from that. And a lot of the, a lot of the protests the year that, you know, we were not necessarily meant to, to get together uh, and, uh, you know, just being so inspired by those who were speaking out and um, d despite this, this um, global threat of, of COVID-19, you know, we're speaking towards Black Lives Matter. And in, so, so this is a, and the toppling monuments, I've been really, right. you know, really wishing I could be there, but I was way up north, waiting out the pandemic. So, when I did go back to the States, we didn't go back to San Francisco. We went to North Carolina, which is where Jonathan is from, my partner. And I just, you know, from that time had to, had to make a series of flags. It was because this American flag had been co-opted by the, you know, by let's just Republicans to be, to be a Trump supporting flag. And the kind of power that these, these flags, but not just the American flag, but also these kinds of representations of, uh, of colonialism that this flag really represented. And so my first idea was to make that bitumen flag that I was performing with in the forest um, that would disintegrate because I was thinking about this um, this article that Wade Davis had written about, and then there's this picture of the American flag that was just disintegrating, and and in the article he speaks about uh, speaks about this you know COVID nineteen also toppling a, a a system that was already defunct and and built on. Uh, on the backs of others on you know like on capitalism that that needs you know that needs needs those backs in order to build on and thinking about this similarity with oil as culture um, especially for folks that are invested into um, their who are citizens of Alberta and it had become a culture. So even if you know, and it is, and an identity, even if you know that the industry is flawed, even though you know that it's contributing to environmental apocalypse, even though you know that it costs more money to process than it does, uh, than it's worth, it still is such a tender identity or sensitive identity politic that is slowly kind of unraveling as, as we move through this other crisis. Uh, and then the next flag was of water and thinking about this, um, and this, this picture is from my iPhone when I was crossing the ferry. So, so, for, for, so, so one of the routes uh, that could be affected by a pipeline, for instance, and so this is a, this is a water 
um, right. and, a, and a monument. So this is the flagpole is my arm in a state of protest. Um, but really it was, I was thinking about the water, the water in protest. Right. I'm wondering, cause you know, everyone has been talking about monuments for the last few years. Um, and well, people have been talking about monuments for much longer than that. Um, how do you conceive of this work as a monument or in relationship to the conversations about monuments that we're currently having? I, I mean, I just thought it was so powerful seeing these monuments crumble. Um, but I also just, I just see them as being uh, co-opted. I see them as being uh, a kind of a visual language that uh, when something topples, something's there to place it. Uh, so that's why it was very important, I think, to make a new kind of monument. It was to, it was to use that visual language to, um, to rebuild a new system. Now do it, you know, like I, again, I, I don't want to be like super, uh, super optimistic that you change a monument and, and it represents a culture, but I do think that there is this way that we live with these monuments um, to remind us of, of some sort of a, found, like a, of a foundation. And now whether that be also a, a uh, foundation that, that is uh, a near, like a false narrative, um, or we use those false narratives to, to, uh, to call out, um, to, to educate, <laughs> or to re-educate. Right. And yeah, I absolutely believe that there, there needs to be, um, man, especially seeing a lot of the the colonial monument, monuments fall uh, that are absolutely to spread this this false rhetoric. They they need to come down. Um, they need to come down, and whether they you know in pieces go back to a museum where it says this you know this this used to be what our culture thought was a founding father of a nation, but now we know that this was. An ins like a, an insecurity of white settlerism that was trying to make a foothold in territory that was stolen. And so this is the kind of way that I like to see a kind of a, uh, a repurposing or re-co-opting or a, a retelling and yeah. to kind of like shift that, shift that narrative. Yeah, no, I think that's really, really important. And um, I mean, this is a beautiful work. I haven't seen this work, Thelma. This is so exciting. Um, yeah, it's it's been really interesting to see just how many ways artists are reacting to monuments and monuments coming down, monuments being defaced, monuments being thrown into rivers like we saw in Bristol. Um, so this is just super exciting. I sort of wanted to... Um, and the official talk here, because we only have about 10 minutes left and uh, we do have one question for you in the chat. Everyone else feel free to add questions in the chat um, and I'll read them out to Thema. So the first one comes from uh, Mercedes. Um, Mercedes. <laughs> and, I'm sorry, Mercedes, I don't know how to pronounce um, the, the first part of your, of your question. Um, but uh, they asked, it's so exciting to see what you've been working on. What role does copper play in Taltan potlatch methodology? Where I'm from, we have copper plates. Was there a feeling or sense while melting down the pennies of the copper's experience while working on what is left? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> let me just say I, for I forgot because it's been a few years, um, the dedication that it takes to sort through thousands of pennies for ones that are 1996 and, uh, and younger, older, older. <laughs> and then, you know, like, and then cleaning some of them and trying, trying so hard. Um, I think, I think though that effort 
I liken it in, in potlatches methodology. So, so speaking of potlatches ceremony, so Mercedes is speaking about the practices of, um, of, of giving copper away in, in potlatch ceremony um, as also actions, uh, several coastal nations would, would uh, break a copper shield as a kind of a shaming ceremony. Um, and then those, those pieces of copper would also be given out to our guests in Palaj. And, or somebody who was very high in social status would, would be giving away this very valuable gift, um, whether it be in pieces to you know, spread the love or, or as, a, as a copper shield for battle. And, um, you know, for, for us, those kinds of gifts existed. Uh, but when you think about the way that potlatch as a system, so the, the, the work that I'm working on now is a contemporary reflection of, of, um, of Taltan potlatch um, as, a, as, a, as a new system, or I call it a, an alternative reality to colonialism or capitalism, um, which is our current system. And so this is how my ancestors lived. And thinking about the way that we appreciated uh, and valued the material is really speaking to a kind of a potlatch methodology. So knowing that these, these objects are more valuable because they are now out of circulation, knowing that they're more valuable because I can only use pennies that are that are older than 1996. Uh, so I'll tell you when I, when you don't, when you're not careful, <laughs> they explode. So it's not just about, it's not just about <laughs> and have this massive chemical reaction that like bubbles up and then it, and then it like blows up this yellow, um, like sparky substance all over the rest of your um, artwork, which is, yeah, I wasn't as careful this time, I'm gonna admit. Uh, so I had a lot of that happen and it was, you know, make, reminded me of my, that I'm alive. <laughs> Anyways, what I'm trying to get at is that the effort that it takes to make these artworks out of these kinds of materials or even the bitumen stomach, for instance, you know, this, this core sample was very hard to come by. It was a gift several years ago from a geologist friend and I had, uh, you know, like I had only a, a limited amount of it and, and um, always wanted to know like what, what I was going to do with it, but, but ended up, uh, ended up with this, with this um, bitumen stomach. But the same thing, you know, like you, there's this kind of experimentation that happens, there's a process, uh, something is worked out. Um, but when it really comes down to it, not only am I appreciating that this substance comes from, you know, could have come from a Taltan mine originally, but I'm also, you know, like I'm, I'm having the time to kind of contemplate that. And so, and how I'm giving back is in several ways. So how I'm giving back is through the artwork itself and through this narrative that I tell through the artwork, you know, to, to honor them, the land. And so this is the way that I'm thinking about potlatch methodology is, is this, yeah, this push pull relationship. So even if it is like hours of sanding or hours of sorting, <laughs> I am, you know, like, and, and, and kind of remining these pennies, it, it really is this kind of effort that, that doesn't, or that, that, um, that is then balanced out by the expense of the land or the expense that the, that it has cost the land. And, um, yeah, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it there as trying to kind of explain the way that I'm thinking about it. Cause I can, I can see it with many other things too. Like I've taught these, uh, this rattle making workshop and I think, man, where does this material come from? Oh, an animal had to die for it to be able to 
uh, be in uh, a rattle. And, and so that's really easy to understand that, that the, the cost that this material has. Um, whereas, you know, in a, like a quick, a quick saran off a sandwich and into the trash, you know, you're not, you're not spending that time with that object in order to know the expense that that, that has on the land. And so just being really conscious of this push and pull and mm -hmm. trying to be more in balance. Right, to have a reciprocal relationship of a sorts or something. That's right. Yeah. With the land, with each other. Yeah. And then also producing artwork, I believe, is right in there with the Pollock methodology because you have this physical physical representation of the spiritual um, or your concept that is really present in, in our, our, uh, in our culture, you know, to be like, this means something. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you so much for elaborating on that. And thank you so much for the question. Um, I think mm -hmm. we're, it's three now. So I think we, we should wrap up and I want to say thank you, Thema, so much.